The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. And we are live on the W2M Network once again. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Harry Broadhurst. I am the voice that you have gotten used to hearing on these 205 Live reviews with Sean Garmer. Sean is stepping down to focus on other endeavors in relations to the W2M Network. So with that being said, I introduce my new 205 Live co-host, Miss Liz. Hello. I'm, 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 I'm going to screw this up. Puglisi. Puglisi. Pigilisi. Okay, I, I, I was close. Hey, I'll, you said, I'll, I'll you said it fine before. <laughs> yeah, well, I got inside of my own head and I stuttered and I stumbled. And if, if you're wondering what she's talking about, make sure you check out our SmackDown Live review with predictions for the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view this Sunday. If you're listening to it, obviously, in this particular week that the show has happened, um, the Hell in a Cell predictions will be a little out of date if you're listening to us next week. But, hey, you can still catch up on last week's episode of SmackDown, so there's that. <laughs> anyway, we are a presentation of the W2M Network. You can find us online at www.w2mnet.com. You can find all kinds of stuff for me over there. Liz is actually making her debut with these particular episodes here in an I mentioned this on the SmackDown review, and I feel the need to repeat it here again, becoming the first woman to cover a wrestling show for a podcast on the W2M Network. Pretty exciting. You're a trendsetter over there, Tika. Crazy. I think that's the only time I've ever been a trendsetter. Whoop, whoop. All right, that's, that's like that seriously as uso as I get. All right, moving on. So, 205 Live. All right, so... You weren't with us the previous weeks since a certain New Jerseyan has been dropped into the cruiserweight division. What are your thoughts on Enzo Amore in the cruiserweight division before we even get started with this show? I don't know. I'm very mixed. I'm very mixed. Um, As I mentioned to you earlier, I did not watch NXT that much, although I knew who everybody was. So when he, he and uh, Cass first appeared, I had this honest to goodness being from New York reaction like you have got to be kidding. This is the most insulting <laughs> and ridiculous spiel I've heard in a long time. I hate that um, Jersey Shore persona so much. It's ridiculous. Um, he's mildly grown on me. I can't say I'm a huge fan. I can see where and why they would put him over on 205 Live. But I don't know. Right, let's I'm talk- kind of iffy about it. Let's talk about the reason that he is on 205 Live and what a lot of people have felt that he could bring to 205 Live, and that is the entertainment value in sports entertainment here. Yes. There's never been any question that 205 Live houses some of the best athletes on the WWE roster. Their ability to flip, dive, turn, and do all kinds of spectacular flippity doos nonwithstanding. That being said, the entertainment aspect has always been something that a lot of people have questioned, whereas something that most people have never questioned in regards to Enzo is his ability to entertain. He rubs a lot of people the wrong way, his colleagues included, but at the same time, he's still getting strong crowd reactions, and he's still selling a crap ton of merchandise. Do you think that Enzo is the kind of shot in the arm that the Cruiserweight division needed in order to, as Enzo put it, to stay relevant? I definitely think he was a shot in the arm they needed. Um, one of the issues I have with 205 Live, they are some of the best athletes. I, You really don't see really see a bad match on there, in my opinion. Um, most of them are very vanilla. A lot of them, to me, blend together. Mm-hmm. I mean, they each have they each have their you know own look, but there's a few of them 
that when I was first started to watch it, I would confuse them. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I know that may sound stupid. They all seem to blend together. Some There's really a lack of the entertainment portion of the um, aspect of it for me. So I, I definitely think he was brought in and does do the just does succeed in amping that up. Well, speaking of new members to be brought into the Cruiserweight division, the newest member of the Cruiserweight division is the man who kicks off the show tonight on 205 Live, and that is their newest attempt at recreating Rey Mysterio Jr. I refer to Kalisto. Mm -hmm. I like Kalisto. I enjoy Kalisto. I mean, keep this kid off of a microphone, but I enjoy his in-ring work. And he found out very quickly that he's not capable of verbally sparring with Enzo because Enzo interrupted Kalisto's promo debut and pretty much put Kalisto in his place. Yes, and I enjoyed it. I did. What are your What are your thoughts on Kalisto being added to the cruiserweight division? First of all, it makes sense. He fits in with the you know, demographic that they're going for. The height, weight, you know, stature, the ability. I, I definitely think that the way he wrestles will be showcased much more on 205 than it would be on SmackDown or Raw. I think there's a little bit more freedom that they get in the ring, where I think well, what he does I, will definitely be showcased. Well, I definitely think that this will end up better for him than being in dumpster matches against Braun Strowman. What Enzo failed to mention is that Kalisto won that dumpster match against Braun Strowman and then got pushed off the stage. But that's, you know, that was like six months ago. So obviously sure. in the WWE's I memory, didn't remember that happened. Either. Well, in the WWE's memory, it never happened if you believe their levels of continuity. That being said, though, <laughs> so Kalisto comes over to 205 Live, as I mentioned. Enzo interrupts his promo, as I mentioned here. And it ends up leading to... Enzo's sympathizer, I guess, kind of ish. Arya Davari being Kalisto's first opponent here on 205 Live. They have a quick sprint of a match, probably about seven or eight minutes, and Kalisto picks up the win with Salida Del Sol. Obviously, with Kalisto getting the title shot at TLC, it makes sense that Kalisto would pick up the win here. What did you think of the match itself? I enjoyed it. I, I have to say, it was probably my favorite match of the. Last three shows from this week. I, I See, enjoy I, a good wrestling match. See, I think I enjoyed the main event a little bit more, but that's because I had more to sink my teeth into as a longtime viewer of 205 Live there. But we'll talk right. about that when we get there. Um, I know that we're not going to be talking about um, tables, ladders, and chairs for another couple of weeks still because we're still two weeks away from there. There, do you think that this would be a wise decision to use Enzo as a transitional champion to get the belt to Kalisto, or do you think that they would be better suited having Kalisto chase Enzo for a while? Personal preference is to have him chase it for a while. I agree, and I the think reason it makes I say that more sense. Yeah, I think that there's a story to be told of Enzo screwing Kalisto out of this title match, much the same way that he was able to get the title off of Neville in the first place. Right. Agreed. I, th I yes. think as much as you could make the argument that Enzo lacks in-ring ability, I think what he, with what he can do, he very much can, can build a good story. Yeah, Enzo's not going to set anybody's work rate charts on fire, but at the same time, yeah, Enzo no. brings personality to this show that's severely lacking. And much the same way as our next participant on this particular episode of 205 Live brings personality to this show as well, I love Drew Gulak's PowerPoint presentation. It's the highlight of my 205 Live week. Okay, you know what? When I was watching it, I said to myself, I'm going to tell these people how much I love PowerPoint presentations, and they're going like, to think I'm crazy, but... One of my last office jobs, um, I was the PowerPoint person for the company. I did them all the time because I enjoyed them. So people were like, oh, you want to do this? Yeah, sure. I love PowerPoints. So I absolutely love what he's doing. Absolutely. See, in your neck of the woods, for those of you who can't tell by the accent, Liz is a native <laughs> New Yorker. In your neck of the woods, specifically right across the Toms over to New Jersey – there is a company known as the Combat Zone. 
that I'm sure you've probably heard of, if not necessarily know about. Yes, I've heard of it. Drew Gulak had a gimmick in the combat zone similar to what he's doing in the WWE. It was Drew Gulak's campaign for a better CZW, much the same way this is his campaign for a better 205 Live. And much the same way that Gulak was such an obnoxious ass to the hardcore CZW (sighs) fans, he's being the same way here with the the spot thirsty 205 Live fans, because in case you haven't noticed, most 205 Live fans don't respond to much unless it's one of those ooh and aws kind of moves. And it makes sense that Gulak would be the guy on the inside of the division that would be speaking out against the evils of the the flipping, the diving, the interrupting, as he was interrupted twice tonight, first by his opponent, Mustafa Ali, and then by member of Titus Worldwide and former cruiserweight champion Akira Tozawa. Yeah. So it would I, I like sense. it. I think it works. It's different, you know, really, but it also fits into, you know, the, the you know, the culture outside of you know wrestling. Everybody's about you know change and betterment and this, that, and the other thing. So I think it's. I think a lot of people will connect to it. I did, but I just like PowerPoint. So. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that he's like the anti-cruiserweight cruiserweight, if that makes sense. It does. Because whereas traditionally division's been all about high-flying action and flippity-doos and flippity-dahs and oohs and ahs, Gulak is going to take you down to the mat, he's going to punish you, and he's going to tap you. Gulak is not about diving, although we did see him kind of give in to peer pressure and dive in a match against Cedric Alexander, which in my opinion is still the best match on 205 Live this year, the two out of three falls match that he had with Cedric Alexander. Mm -hmm. But Gulak is going to be that guy that stands out as one of those non-vanilla personalities in this division because you just don't see so much of these guys getting anything to do. Like, I couldn't pick Tony Nese out of a lineup if he had a shirt on. That's that's what I was, that goes back to what I was saying earlier. So many of them, I don't mean that they, you know, physically actually look alike, but they blend together. Some aspects of their look do. They all have dark hair, not that they should bleach their hair, but they all have dark hair. They all have similar builds. They, some of them sound the same. You know, there's nothing other than they're flipping around in the air, you know, that makes them stand out one from the other. They're all, I think everybody on 205 is amazing in the ring. I don't think there's one person you could say that isn't good or isn't as good oh, as you know, some of the others. You know, well, except, well, except Enzo. Yes, except Enzo. Everything's except Enzo. But they just blend together. You so, know, as and, mentioned, oh, go ahead. I thought you were no, done. No, there. Okay. Go ahead. No, 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 good. It's fine. All right, I was just going to say that, as mentioned, we do see Gulak in action against Mustafa Ali, who has, in my opinion, the second prettiest move in the cruiserweight division behind Neville's Red Arrow, and that would be the 054. I, as of everybody on 205, he's my favorite. Gulak gets distracted by Tazawa at ringside, and on the stage and wherever else Tazawa was for the course of this match and ends up falling victim to a kick courtesy of Mustafa Ali. And then Ali hits the 054, which for those of you that don't know, it is an imploding 450, by which I mean he's facing out towards the crowd and comes inbound with the 450. It's one of the prettiest moves in the WWE outside of the Red Arrow. Absolutely beautiful. And the fact that he hits it with such precision is amazing because, frankly, somebody as uncoordinated as me wouldn't be able to get around once, let alone one and a half times like that. I'm lucky I could walk a straight line on a good day. I, I'd be, I'd be doing like backflop sentons off of the top. <laughs> if I were him. That would be that would be my chunky butt up there. But in fairness, I ain't 205 pounds either, so there's that. But anyway, so Tazawa gets into Gulak's face after the match and does his repeated ah, ah, ah chant. I think Tazawa's time in the cruiserweight division should come to an end, though. I don't think that there's a whole lot left for him once he finishes this feud with Gulak, and I think that he would be better served in the Raw tag team division with um, Apollo Crews as Titus Worldwide representing going after the tag team titles over on Raw because one of the things that Raw is desperate for right now is tag teams, and I feel like Tazawa's done about all that he can do in the cruiserweight division 
especially since they're seemingly shying away from giving any of the current cruiserweights a shot at Enzo in the cruiserweight title. I agree. Um, I was actually surprised to see him come out tonight. Um, and, and, you know, I know it's part of the thing that's been going on, but it didn't, for me, it didn't add anything to it, but it didn't also, also didn't really take anything away from it. Um, I could definitely see Akira on um, or, or even even SmackDown doing something different. Well, not to mention, I think that, in my opinion, outside of Neville, Akira Tozawa might be the best worker in the Cruiserweight division as well. And he's somebody whose personality, that despite the fact that he speaks limited English, still translates even to the point of almost being like that stamina monster that he's portrayed as and almost being a charisma monster as well. And the fact that he doesn't need to be able to speak the language of the English language in order to be able to connect with the fan base. I connect more with him than I do with uh, Shinsuke. And you still with that the whole language barrier thing. Okay. I yeah. No, it's just it's a strong statement to make, but I could see where people would come from that way because of the fact that a lot of people think that Shinsuke's well, I mean, ever since he's come up to SmackDown, Shinsuke's been pretty much an entrance and not a whole lot else, especially given what the context of his feud with Mahal. Whereas Akira Tozawa had a feud with Neville that a lot of people really enjoyed, and he's having the opportunity to inter. He's having the opportunity to interact with the non cruiserweight division entities over on Raw because of his interaction with Titus Worldwide as well. Right. I can't say that I've ever seen a match of Akira's that I didn't enjoy. Agreed. Yeah, Akira can go. I mean, he he got a really good match out of Brian Kendrick, which is something that we talked about earlier here when they had their uh, when they had their street fight earlier in the year. And Sean says that that's still one of his favorite matches in two hundred five live this year. That was, a good, that was a wonderful match. Shout out to our producer, Sean Garmer, as well. All right, moving on. Backstage promo from the aforementioned Brian Kendrick. Segway! As he talks about the fact that he now regrets not supporting Enzo because he knows what it's like to be Enzo. Uh-huh. And you yeah. wouldn't be trying to kiss up for a title shot like Arya Davari is. Okay, sure, let's go with that. I think... Maybe doing kind of an us versus them mentality in this division might not be the worst idea. But at the same time, I think you need to mix up the participants. Because if all the heels side with Enzo, then what the hell's the point? Yeah, there's just the same old, same old, really. The heels, good guys versus, versus the bad guys. I would love to see them do something where it's much more mixed up. Because they very rarely do. I would love to see something... That is almost, for lack of a better term, you know, true life. Sometimes we relate to the villain. We're fed up with something, you know. And you take his, you take their side in this one thing and makes you see things differently. I would love to see something like that. I am going to use words that I've never thought I'd use in the same sentence here. There are certain aspects with which I agree with Vince Russo. Professional wrestling needs to have shades of gray characters. There needs to be people yes. that can identify. There needs to be people that can identify with either side. There needs I to will. be people yeah. that, despite the fact that most people may feel like they're doing the wrong thing, they still feel justified in their actions. The anti-hero or the anti-villain in professional wrestling works. Look at the case of arguably the biggest anti-hero of all time in Steve Austin. Something like that would never happen in modern day WWE. No, never. But I've had this conversation with, with you know, with friends that watch wrestling, and you know, like some people are like, oh, this one's a, a tweener or whatever. But it's it's not, you know, it's not really the same thing. They definitely need something where, with with the with the shades of gray, absolutely. For me, it makes you want us to suspend belief and you want us to believe that this is all real in real life, and I think that's exactly what would do it. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that everybody needs to be sitting together and singing Kumbaya after shows oh, and no, stuff. But at, the same, but at the same time, though, it would make sense. Like, I take you back. I don't know how far back your wrestling watching goes. Mm -hmm. I go all the way back to early 90s is my starting point. I, I think my first pay-per-view was when I was like four with my grandfather. 
Mm-hmm. I go back to the NWA era with Sting and Lex Luger and the fact that Luger was a dastardly villain back in the mid-90s. But him and Sting were still cools, and Sting was the white meat baby yes. face. Yes, exactly. I feel like you can have relationships like that that work in professional wrestling, and I feel like you can have people that are siding with Enzo that are on both the heel and the face side of the spectrum here. Now, granted, Enzo needs to stop being such a yutz to all of them, but at the same time, if you can tone down Enzo's vernacular towards these people here, then you have the opportunity to tell a, con- a very compuls- a captivating excuse me, story that will – have more and more people entertained and tuning in to see what goes down on 205 Live. You're offering more and more in the way of the entertainment aspect, which is what you have Enzo on 205 Live for in the first place. Because that's what it was slowly missing. Absolutely. All right. That takes us to our main event contest as Cedric Alexander takes a loss to Jack Gallagher here by disqualification after hitting Gallagher with his own umbrella that Gallagher threw into the ring. Wasn't that a great match? I See, you mentioned the fact that you thought that the opener was the best match on, on WWE television this week. I actually think that the main event here between Alexander and Gallagher was the best match on WWE TV this week. I am a huge fan of Cedric Alexander, and as my Wrestling Unwrapped co-host Patrick Ketz had dubbed him Jack the Ripper, the reinvigoration of uh, Jack Gallagher now that he's turned heel has been something to see here just because of the fact that you get to see that much more vicious, that much more aggressive side to Gallagher that you didn't get to see when he was a plucky baby face. Mm-hmm. Anyone who can wrestle in the outfit that Gallagher wrestles in or at least wrestled in today and do what he <laughs> did has had him a tie and a vest. I mean, Absolutely. That alone made it one of the greatest matches I've seen in a while. Not to mention, he still came out of that looking like a badass. Yep. Yep. Absolutely agree. I, I did I did enjoy the first match. Um, maybe because I was feeling wrestling, you know, deprived. Maybe because I just enjoy the two opponents. But the main event was absolutely stellar. And I think Cedric came off looking like a beast. My my big takeaway from this year is that obviously we're not done here, and I think that's the important thing to look at here because I think if you give these guys a chance to build up to a stipulation match and then give them the opportunity to have 15 to 20 minutes to blow off said mm-hmm. stipulation, these guys could put on match of the year type stuff against each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cedric Alexander may be the most underrated cruiserweight in the division right now. And Gallagher, as I mentioned, seems reinvigorated by the heel turn. And the fact of the matter is, is most of his ring work has always been crisp anyways. Right. And he was a little bit too much, a little too gimmicky, you know, when with the polka dot trunks almost, you know, really is the void villainy, you know, type thing. And I don't, I don't think that really worked for him. This Jack the Ripper, the the silent assassin kind of thing that he's got going on now, seems much more fitting for his character. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think getting him away from buying Kendrick would probably do him, a, do him more of a service as far as his ability to develop with his character. But at the same time, I understand wanting to learn some of the tricks from the greatest villain in the cruiserweight division. Because Kendrick's kind of that old guard of the cruiserweight division, much the same way we talked about how Mickey James, we've talked about before over on Yes, how Mickey James is that old guard of the women's division right now, especially on Monday Night Raw. And I guess you could say to an extent Natalia is the same way over on SmackDown. True. But I think ultimately you could, you'll probably see Kendrick versus Gallagher now. Well, I think that it's going to get to the point that Kendrick's going to realize the monster that he created and have to do something about it down the road. See, I would love that. A little bit Dr. Frankenstein-ish. Having to take out his own monster, exactly. Yeah. That's that's great. And I think the two, I definitely think the two of them have what it takes to tell a good story like that. Or tell a story in general. I do believe that's going to about do it for us for 205 Live, except to slap a rating on this particular episode, Liz. So why don't you go ahead and give me a scale of 1 to 10 rating for tonight's episode of 205 Live. 
I'm gonna go with an eight. Okay. Why? Well, I, I, I think it because out of the three shows, I really did enjoy all the matches. I mean, I really did enjoy the first one. I did enjoy the main event. I'm not that a huge fan of Enzo, but he, you know, he does make it entertaining. He does bring it to life a bit. Um, but it was the best of the three shows this week. Hands down. I have a. I have a hard time disagreeing with you on that. I'm going to go a little bit lower than you did. I'm going to give this the same rating you gave SmackDown. I'm giving 205 Live a 7. But at the Mm -hmm. same time, considering the fact that I did Raw and SmackDown this week here on the W2M Network, as well as doing 205 Live now, this is the highest rating I've given to any of the three shows this week on the W2M Network. Because of the fact... too, I want to be a little nice. Well, because because of the fact... Because of the fact, too, for me, in regards to 205 Live tonight, the focus was by and large in the ring, which I always appreciate, especially coming off of a rather lackluster go-home episode of SmackDown. The stories that they're telling on 205 Live make sense from both a in-ring standpoint as well as from a personality standpoint. You have Gulak trying to make 205 Live better. You have Tozawa still wanting to do Tozawa things. You have Enzo and Kalisto at opposite ends of the sports entertainment spectrum and going at each other because of it. You have Cedric Alexander who's trying to make his own name and you have Jack Gallagher who's sick of everybody treating him as a laughingstock as Kendrick put it. So you have all these different people now who are starting to develop these personalities here and I think that That's one of the biggest noticeable differences in 205 Live is the fact that they're actually attempting to tell stories with 205 Live now, and I greatly appreciate it. One of the reasons I was very generous with my score is also because out of the three shows, 205 is like makes me think, ooh, I have to see what happens next week. Whereas with the other two, I feel like I pretty much know what's going to happen next week. I could skip watching and still sit here and talk to you about them. Whereas 205, it's like, oh, I really got to, you know, I feel like I want to watch it next week. Yeah, there was definitely a, okay, I'm interested to see what happens next vibe to this show. And we'll find out what happens live next week together here (laughs) on the 205 Live Review. (laughs) Welcome to W2M, Liz. Thank you, Harry. (laughs) As mentioned, this is the W2M Network. You can find us online at www.w2mnet.com. In addition, you can find our 205 Live reviews here over at 411mania.com. I filled in for Gary on the Raw review, so myself and Paul Leeser did Raw for for, uh, W2M this week. I just called W2M 205 again, just the same way I did at the end of the SmackDown review. Smooth, Harry. Slow down. Take a breath. All right. Me and Paul Leeser handle the raw details for this week for the W2M. Liz joins me now as my permanent co-host going forward for SmackDown and 205 Live. I will be back here on the W2M Network tomorrow night for the kickoff with my co-hosts Stephen Err and Brandon Biskabing. And then Thursday, Paul and I will be recording the NXT review here for the W2M Network. So make sure you stay tuned to W2M Network and W2Mnet.com. Make sure you check us out on all of your favorite podcast providers, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio. You can find us on YouTube as well if you search W2M Network and so many other places. Again, thanks for joining me, Liz. Thanks for listening, everybody. For the newest member of the Wrestling to the Max Network, Liz Puglisi, I'm Harry Broadhurst. Thank you for listening to the 205 Live Review here on the W2M Network. Have a great week, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment.